So welcome everybody to our first meeting of 2024. And before we get started, I wish to acknowledge that I live in the unceded ancestral and traditional territory of the Musqueam, Squamish and Tsleil-Waututh nations. And I'm sure there are people here who are coming from other parts of the country also. So today we have a presentation that's going to be by Richard Stokes. And I'm going to let Richard introduce you himself and uh, then proceed with his presentation. So Richard, uh, could you uh, share your screen with us, please? Sure. And then introduce yourself and you can start anytime you wish. Unmute. Uh, Jesus Christ. What is going on here? We, we see you, uh, Richard. You're there. I'm there. You screen perfectly well. Yeah. Just trying to uh, get rid of that. Okay. So I'm going to be talking today about uh, a trip we took uh, last year in April, May. Uh, to the southwest USA, an area I've not visited before, so I'm very keen to do this. Hey, do you know how to get this speaker to work? Uh, some people need to mute, I think. Yes, I'm, I'm muting them. Okay, great. So uh, you can see the screen all right? Perfectly. Excellent. So we uh, we took a trip to Southern California uh, to stay with some friends for 10 days in Palm Desert and then took uh, advantage of the fact that we were down in the southwest corner to see some sites that I wanted to see for many years. And, uh, these included a trip to Page, Arizona to see the slot canyons there. Monument Valley at the Arizona-Utah border, and then a, a little further up in Utah to see the Arches National Park and Canyonlands. And then finally we managed to come back home via Idaho, Oregon and Washington. It was a long trip, a lot of driving, so uh, I think I wouldn't uh, want to do that much driving again, but uh, it was well worth it in the end. So we took about two and a half days to get down to Palm Beach, uh, sorry, Palm Desert in uh, Southern California from Vancouver. Uh, quite strenuous driving in especially Southern California where there were a lot of uh, maniac truck drivers. And once we'd had our trip in uh, to Palm Desert, we then came back home the long way, you might say, via a trip up to Page, we spent a couple of days then on to Kayenta was uh, a place okay. where we stayed okay, okay. okay. Yeah, so. sorry anyway that we went to Kayenta where we could access Monument Valley and after that we went up and stayed at Moab uh, to visit the Canyon Lands and the Arches National Parks and then after all that we slowly went our way back to Vancouver so we started off in uh, Palm Desert. Some friends of ours had, had got a, a place down there at the Hilton Grand Vacation Club. And as they had a, a spare bedroom in the uh, the unit, they uh, asked us to join and we were very happy to do so. That's mainly for me to get some golfing down in Southern California, but also some of the sites down there. So this is the place where you stay in, as I say, the Hilton Grand Vacation Club. It's, uh, got a, a pool here. They had all, all the facilities that you'd want. And uh, all sorts of plant and wildlife in the grounds as well. We had uh, things running up onto our patio here. And there was these California fan palms here that had obviously been well groomed by the, uh, the gardeners because elsewhere where we saw them, you could see why their other name is the bearded palm. The, the dead 
foliage from uh, previous years still stays attached to the, the tree and slowly builds up into this large bearded looking uh, structure, which is in fact uh, a, a good environment for all sorts of wildlife. Many insects live in it, and of course that attracts uh, reptiles, lizards live inside as well. Birds will use it for roosting and for nesting material. And when you see them on the golf course, as we did many a time, they're also a good place to see golf balls wedged into the uh, the old foliage. And if, if you've got a ladder, you could collect quite a few golf balls there. And talking of golf, uh, whilst we were there, played numerous rounds of golf on really top quality courses, uh, which of course you had to pay for. In that uh, Coachella Valley area, there's all sorts of golf courses, but they're all very expensive. This was the one right next to where we were staying. It's called the Desert Willow Golf Resort. Really well looked after and a, a, a pleasure to play at. And you've got something we don't see up here. Now, we might get crows on the fairway, but down there they get this bird called the Greater Roadrunner. You can see it there, and this is it blown up. One of the birds that I'd wanted to see down there, because of course we don't get them up here. And we saw many examples of it, quite a comical bird. They are uh, basically are famous from the cartoons in the old days where it was the wily coyote he was chasing the roadrunner all the time obviously with no success but they didn't quite get the naming of the bird right it is not called fastilus tastilus its real name is geococcyx californianus and it gets its name the coccyx refers to uh, the greek word for cuckoos and that's because the greater roadrunner is in the cuckoo family and interestingly, just a side effect, the tailbone of humans is also called the coccyx. And the reason for that is that the, uh, the anatomist Galen, when he saw the tailbone, thought it looked like a cuckoo's beak and so called it the coccyx. Right. These birds um, are basically found on the ground. They, they can fly, but they do most of their hunting on the ground and they uh, basically feed on lizards, uh, snakes, and large insects like grasshoppers, anything you can get in fact. Because on one of the golf courses we played, uh, roadrunners were coming up to the uh, patio whilst we were having a drink and searching for french fries. So they'll obviously take anything. And they're a, a sort of interesting bird in that they, they spend a lot of time static just looking for prey and when they see it they make a mad dash for it really fast and strangely enough every time they make a dash and stop the tail lifts up like this and then slowly comes back down again not sure what the reason is for that but that's what they do and sometimes they raise their crest as well but again not always but really a nice bird we did see other birds though, and one of them here is the Costa's hummingbird. Uh, unfortunately, uh, I couldn't get the shot where the light was in the right direction because this gorget here, which uh, looks a bit like a walrus moustache in this particular species, would be the same colour as the back of the head here, this sort of magenta purple. But to get that colour, you have to have the light in the right direction because the feathers aren't actually coloured, they just reflect light such that you get that purpley pink coloration. Another lovely little bird we saw was a thing called a verdi, uh, sometimes called a gold tit or yellow-headed titmouse. Sort of filled the niche that chickadees would fill up here, that they uh, go around hunting for small insects in the bushes and trees. But they're an absolutely lovely little bird. As you can see here, they've got this uh, yellowy orange head and a, a red shoulder just here. And uh, this one here was collecting seeds from a plant. I do not know what it was. Not sure whether they were after the, the actual seeds or the, the, the cottony material attached to the seed might have been used for nesting material. 
because we were there in the nesting time. Other birds we saw, um, the northern mockingbird. Uh, that's a bird we get up here sometimes, so uh, it wasn't unknown to us. This one was having a bad hair day, obviously. So California scrub jays, uh, numerous types of scrub jays. They're not really closely related to the, the stellar jay that we get up here. So whilst uh, my friend and I were playing golf, our wives went horse riding one time. And uh, apparently it was a, an excellent day out. They were put on these two horses that were a brother and sister that were very well behaved and were taken on a trek through the, the uh, lowlands and hills of, of the area. And because we were there in the springtime, we were lucky enough to catch the, the wild flowers and were told it was a uh, an especially good year for flowers. And so they were trekking through all these uh, swaths of colour. So a couple of the things we did other than playing golf and horse riding were to visit the Joshua Tree National Park and to also visit uh, the Salton Sea and especially Sunny Bolton National Wildlife Refuge so that there uh, we could hopefully see some birds. Now the Salton Sea is a, an interesting place it's basically what they call an endorheic lake, and, and that's a, a body of water that has no outlet. And it uh, currently is sitting quite significantly below sea level. And like most endorheic lakes, it's uh, saline. And because it has no outlets, the only way the water is lost is by evaporation or, or seepage the ground. So they get more and more saline. Now, millions of years ago, the, um, the Colorado River had flowed into what is now called Imperial Valley. It had been deposited in soil and it turned the place into lovely farmland, which had been used uh, more recently for that purpose. But uh, more recently, there were thousands of years where the river alternately flowed into the valley or around it, leaving a, a lake called Lake Kuahila after the, the local Native Americans, uh, or in in the times when the, the river moved away, it became a desert basin, highly saline. But in 1900, there was an irrigation canal that diverted water from the Colorado River to enable the Imperial Valley to um, grow various crops and fruits. But it wasn't built very well, and there was a breach in the canal, and the current lake formed from the waters of the river. So the lake would have dried up, but farmers had been using so much uh, Colorado River water for irrigation that they uh, let the excess flow into the lake. They were staying not not easy. As a body. So in the 50s and 60s, the area was a resort destination and was well populated. And communities grew up. Bird watching was very popular because the lake had got a, a large population of fish. So, of course, birds on the Pacific Flyway were stopping off there during their migrations to feed on the fish. But in the 80s, contamination started running off from the farms and they weren't, uh, they were being more frugal with their irrigation so that there wasn't so much runoff of uh, excess. Colorado River water. And this uh, runoff and contamination spread wildlife diseases, uh, lots of die off of birds and fish. So basically, the tourism has been drastically reduced. So these postcards from the 50s and 60s show what a, a resort it was like, but this is more what it's like now. This huge park, car park that we visited. Here, you actually do see some vehicles. We were the only vehicle stopped here going to the visitor centre. So it's it's basically a dead sea now and no tourists at all. Though there are efforts to try and revive it. And part of that is there's a wildlife refuge that was set up and named after Sonny Bono, who was a famous pop star in the 60s in part of the Sonny and Cher duo. 
But he later became a politician. First, he was mayor of Palm Springs and then became a member of the House of Representatives. And he's, he would champion the restoration of the Salton Sea, but uh, unfortunately died in a skiing accident in the 90s. So uh, he's obviously not doing that anymore. Whilst we were there, though, we were lucky enough, uh, the, the local ranger pointed us toward a, a small colony of burrowing owls, which is a, a bird I've wanted to see for many a year. They are present in BC, but they're extremely rare and protected. So it's, uh, I've never managed to see one up here. Down there, we were directed to some uh, farmland down a, a, a little access road, and we saw eight burrowing owls sitting around their burrows, which either they've dug themselves or they've taken over uh, some rodent burrow, and that's where they nest. And although they do hunt through the night, mainly for small rodents, they will spend this, a large part of the day sitting on posts, um, looking for who knows what, tourists perhaps, this guy's checking us out, but this one's looking for possible predators high up in the sky. But lovely little birds. We also visited Joshua Tree National Park where, of course, you see the Joshua tree, which is not, in fact, a tree, but a member of the Yucca family. We were there in spring. Again, you could see uh, flower heads here. Uh, and an enlargement of that, you can see the, the large cluster of flowers there. They're strange plants. They grow in all sorts of weird and wonderful shapes and are all over the park. But... Very often we could see behind the trees were these monzogranic rock formations, these large piles of boulders which seem to have been stacked carefully on top of each other. Another view of it here which shows the, the piling of the rocks which seem to be on, um, on top of, carefully placed on top of each other. But in fact, it's the result of uh, a magma chamber um, about 100 million years ago, which uh, formed granite, and it's a kind of granite called monza granite. And as it cooled down, it cracked into vert with vertical and horizontal cracks, which allowed rainwater in. And that slowly eroded the granite and became soil between all the different cracks and that. And that soil has been eroded and left these piles of, of boulders neatly stacked up, some of which, of course, have rolled down over the years. And then further weathering has caused all sorts of strange patterns. We've got uh, this rock is called skull rock for obvious reasons, and that is the result of this erosion. And we saw this rock as well that had, uh, looked like an ice cream scoop taken out of it again. It'd been weathered that way. Another one looked like it was a, a large dinosaur peeping over the top. And here's an, a good example to show the, the vertical and horizontal cracks that were in the rock that are slowly weathered away and opened up bigger gaps. And as the weathering continues, this allows for plants to take a foothold, and we've got a juniper tree here, and here's a desert Canterbury bells, and they'll, as these uh, plants grow and, and uh, die and rot, that produces even better soil, so other plants can then get a foothold, and slowly the plants will grow there. Like I say, we were lucky enough to be there in the spring where the uh, flowers were coming out, and it was a particularly good year, so we saw quite a lot of different flowers in, in the Joshua National Park. Here we see a phacelia, the notch-leafed phacelia. There were poppies, uh, a bit like the California poppy that you might have in your garden. It's a different species, though, in, in the uh, Serona Desert. Uh, here's a salvia. It's uh, called a chia, common name. There was an evening primrose that we saw. Uh, a paintbrush, the desert Indian paintbrush, again, similar to the uh, paintbrush we see up here, 
but a different species. Uh, there were desert globe mallows and desert rock peas. There's a pincushion and a thing called uh, cinch weed, uh, sometimes chinch weed, depending on which common name is going. Pectus composer is its Latin name. And this one we saw the desert dandelion, they were all over. They were vast swaths of desert dandelions turning the, the uh, countryside lovely yellow. And of course, cactus. Uh, here's a hedgehog cactus with absolutely vicious spines, but beautiful red flowers. And then a strangely named teddy bear choller cactus. Not, uh, not the teddy bear you'd want to uh, be taking to bed with you. These spines apparently are extremely painful to, to remove if you ever are foolish enough to try and grab hold of them. Here's one perhaps a bit more familiar. It's a member of the prickly pear family. And this is the dollar joint prickly pear cactus. We also saw some lizards, quite a lot of them in fact. Uh, I'm not too good on my lizards, so these are best guesses as identification. That uh, I think is a male and a female desert spiny lizard, a western side blotched lizard, and I'm pretty sure about this one, it's the Great Basin Fence Lizard. So after we'd finished our trip in uh, Coachella Valley, uh, our friends drove back home to Vancouver whilst we carried on a bit uh, northeast, you might say, up to uh, northern Arizona, where we stayed in a town called Page to access something I've wanted to see for the longest time, the Antelope Canyons, a uh, slot canyon system that uh, uh, quite spectacular. But also in Page, there are other things to see is the Horseshoe Bend, uh, an oxbow um, lake in, in its making on, on the Colorado River, which has been dammed by the Glen Canyon Dam, resulting in the formation of a huge uh, extensive lake called Lake Powell. And it's, it's possible to rent houseboats and you could take easily two weeks cruising around exploring Lake Powell. But we didn't have time for that. Like I say, I was mainly there to see the uh, antelope slot canyons. Here's the Glen Canyon Dam holding back the River Colorado, obviously used for hydro uh, electric generation. And uh, a landmark in the Page area is this thing, Tower Butte, that uh, is, can be seen from most of the town. And an overlook lets you see down to this uh, houseboat rental station, Marina Humming. Uh, where you can pick up a houseboat and have a holiday on Lake Powell. Here's a, one of the many, many arms of Lake Powell. Whilst there, we did some birding, of course, as we do everywhere we go. I uh, saw a lovely example of a bullock's oriole one morning. Bright orange and black bird, lovely. Also uh, stumbled on some turkey vultures in their roost, their overnight roost. We're getting ready for um, uh, heading off for breakfast, I guess. Here's a bird we saw a lot of in the area, the rock wren. Uh, interestingly, it's a bird that you can see up here in British Columbia. And we've spent many hours looking for them in the Okanagan area and had some success to find them. But they're very uncommon in BC, whereas down there they were very common. We saw them everywhere we went, and were, they were quite close, so we could get good folk moving. Uh, another bird only found in the south, not up here, is the white winged dove. That was good to see. And there's a strange thing that we found. <coughs> As you might know, most bees are not um, uh, colony formers, they are solitary, uh, where the, the female, the queen, will dig a nest 
pack food into that nest, lay their eggs on it, and then and leave the grubs to hatch and develop on their own. But some species uh, will form these massive aggregations where the, the solitary bees dig their nests very close to each other. It was like a whole array of little volcanoes, quite interesting. We went to see the Horseshoe Bend, the um, Oxbow Lake in the formation. Quite a spectacular sight. But the main thing I was there for was to see the Slot Canyon system there. And it's, uh, they're all located on Navajo land uh, in the Page area. Uh, there are six separate scenic slot canyons in that area. And they're Upper Antelope Canyon, Rattlesnake Canyon, Owl Canyon, Mountain Sheep, Canyon X and Lower Antelope Canyon. We visit two of them, the Upper Antelope Canyon, which is the most accessible. It's uh, entrance and length are at ground level, so it's quite easy to do that one. No climbing involved. In the others, there is climbing, and we visited Lower Antelope, which uh, required significant climbing up and down fixed stairways. The two canyons were quite different. Upper Antelope has got a very narrow uh, at the top, and it's quite dark. The lower is a little wider at the top, so more light comes in. We were concerned at how many tourists there might be, and there certainly were a lot, but uh, the access is, is very well controlled by the uh, various families who run each different slot canyon. And groups of six or eight are entering the canyons at about 10 minutes apart. Doesn't seem much, but it was enough to keep each group separate. They, the guides move you along at a, a steady pace. So uh, it didn't appear too crowded, even though there were hundreds of people going through each day. Now, in the old days, they did have special photographic tours where you could take tripods, which uh, make the uh, photographing the canyons much more easy. That's not allowed anymore, no tripods. So photography is quite challenging in these, these uh, canyons. So here's some shots of the upper Antelope Canyon. You can see the, the rock is, is carved by uh, water over the uh, years. The canyons are quite narrow and that's because it's a small stream of water that has eroded them. But every now and then there's a flash flood and this will cause quite a lot of erosion. And you get these wave-like forms in the rock and uh, various bits jutting out. But the flash flood situation uh, presents a danger. And it was only back in the 90s that I think it was seven tourists lost their lives because a flash flood came down the canyon and uh, basically drowned them. So now they um, look at the, the weather forecast in a much wider area. So even 10 miles away, they'll know if there's a, a storm that will result in a flash flood coming through in a, an hour's time. And they have various um, rope ladders that can be dropped down from the top so that people can climb out. Anyways, the waters have carved these beautiful formations. And because the light is coming in uh, very much in, in a directional way because of the way the sun moves over the narrow opening at the top, you get all these color variations. Of, depending on whether the rocks are in shadow or direct light, but purples, pinks, and oranges, and all sorts of wonderful formations. So here's a, a, a bit with a, a golden glow in it, but here, it, because it's more in shadow, it seems a, a more brown color. But you can see all the different layers of sedimentation that formed the sandstone rock in the first place. And here's a sort of horse's head here. Here's a, a, a wave formation in orange. Another protrusion sticking out. This one gives you an idea of how deep the canyon is 
here's, here are the people are ahead of us. And you can see here's the daylight up here. Right, they're about um, 30, 40 meters deep. And here, the guide throws some sand up and it comes trickling down so you can get a photo. I'm, I'm sure this is the only example of this photo you've ever seen. Absolutely unique. The more golden colours. Again, this sort of wave formation that, that is throughout the canyon. Absolutely fantastic thing to visit. There's some more different colorations, purples through pinks, purple and gold. And here Fortunately, this this uh, log here is keeping the the two sides from meeting and crushing us all. So that was good to see. One of my favourites here, this sort of purple and pink wave. And then we visited the next day the lower Antelope Canyon. As you can see, as you enter this one, you, you're going down these uh, steep steps. Apparently. Uh, these these steps have only been installed fairly recently and it used to just be rope ladders that you had to climb down. So I'm not sure if I'd have managed that one. A bit wider, so a bit more light coming in. Here's another lovely wave formation. This is my favourite one. Here's our group. Uh, you can see this rock formation sticking out. And it's it definitely worth looking up every now and then. You tend to keep your eyes straight ahead of you and looking side to side. But when you look up, you can see the sky sometimes and you get this orange, pink and purple. Another wave formation, another beautiful one. Here you see the the sedimentary rock has been eaten into by the water, leaving these different layers. More golden colours. It's a browner, yellow colour. And here we we're lucky enough to manage to get a, a shaft of sunlight. This is because the sun was directly above the canyon at that particular moment. It's this area was called the Furnace for obvious reasons. Another lovely swirling ice cream look. And this is uh, the end of it. And you had to climb up this very steep set of ladders to get out. And here's what it looks like from the top as we're emerging out of the slot canyon. You can see as it runs through the, the area on this. Uh, this is called Navajo Sandstone. So having uh, managed to see the slot canyons, we then moved on to see Monument Valley, which wasn't far away at all, uh, just about an hour, hour and a half's drive. Now we had hoped to stay, uh, there's a, uh, a hotel here, actually in Monument Valley, but um, it, did, it was fully booked and anyway, it was horribly expensive. So we stayed about a, an hour's drive away uh, at a place called Kayenta, which is basically just a site that serves Monument Valley. It's still loads of hotels and restaurants. So Monument Valley and the next door, Mystery Valley, it's a region of the Colorado Plateau and it's uh, basically sandstone buttes that make it so attractive. And some of them are 300 meters. So there's Mises, buttes and, and pillars that are seen all uh, along the valley floor. And the most famous ones are located in Northeast Arizona. It's right on the Utah, Arizona state line. Uh, it, it's on Navajo land and they run the whole business. Uh, and it's a sacred area to them. The Navajo people. So after we'd uh, dropped off our bags at Kienta in our hotel, we uh, had 
majority of the day left. So we went up and did this, the self-guided loop drive. And that's, uh, you enter here, and here's the, the um, visitor center and the hotel. And then you, you go around this self-guided loop. We took about, I think, four hours to do it, stopping off for views and, and photographs. And here's another absolute unique shot you'll have never seen before of the West and East Mittens and Merrick Buttes. Uh, it was interesting We because uh, we went there twice. Uh, so uh, we saw it four times at different times of the day and on different days. And, and the lighting was different each time. It's quite variable. It changed the way it looked. You can see why they're called the mittens. The west and the east mitten. It's like they've got thumbs sticking up. These are towers, but this is the remaining part of the route. Helped out by Moya showing us what it is. So here's the west mitten with a, a strategically placed um, juniper, dead juniper tree. Uh, black and white version of the same thing, different bit of juniper. Here's Merrick Butte, which you can't see because of that. Again, black and white with a bit of blue coloration. Here are, are what was called the three sisters, and each mesa will slowly um, be eroded down to a, a smaller size where it becomes a butte and then they're slowly eroded and sometimes there will be pillars of rock that are left and this, in this case there was three and that hence the name the three sisters here's a famous point the john ford point it's called because the film director john ford made his uh, films all way back 40s 50s i think um Lots of westerns he, that he filmed in Monument Valley. And uh, I think it was John Wayne or, or some actor was uh, on a horseback here, which is a famous shot from one of the movies, I don't know, Stagecoach or something like that. I couldn't get John Wayne. I had to make do with this tourist instead. And we were taken to one place. This was the, the second day on, on the private tour that we took. With a guide took us to this place called the Eagle, uh, which was a, a uh, an arch with a, a pothole uh, in the in the top of the arch area. And you might, if you follow the line here, you, you might see why it is called an eagle. There's the beak, and there's its eye. And you could only see this if you lay down on your back um, on on the rock and looked up. Quite a sight that suddenly appeared when you lay down like that. We're also taking the place called the Totem Pole here. A lovely example of a tower. And nearby, another butte that's been eroded, and it's called the, I'm sure my pronunciation is not good here, the Yabi Che rocks. And they're meant to represent uh, dancers coming out of uh, a, what is called a Hogan, the, the home of the Navajo people. Another shot of the potent pole with the juniper tree. And here's the Hogans. These are the traditional homes that the Navajo or Diné people, as they call themselves, they live in. So the, the general living quarters are various sizes of this domed family home, and they're called the female Hogan, the circular Hogan. Whereas the forked stick, which is what holds up this area, or male hogan, that has a vestibule that the female does not have. These were used for ceremonies and uh, are considered uh, a sacred place. So it didn't have as much use. This is the home for everyday use. So the next day we took a guided tour and the guide took us through Mystery Valley as well as also areas of Monument Valley that we hadn't seen the day before. He was a great guy. He gave us a tune on his flute at one point. 
took us to what he called the cowpat rocks, but uh, properly named the pancake rocks. Uh, they're, they're petrified sand dunes that have got uh, eroded over the years, leaving these strange saucer-shaped rocks. Number of arches as well, moccasin arch, stout arch, and honeymoon arch. These were all uh, kind of prelude to when we went to Arches National Park. You can see this one's a, quite a sizable thing. He also showed us some Anasazi ruins. Uh, here's one that they called the Square House for obvious reasons. Here's another one. And these ruins are the uh, Anasazi, who were the ancient ones in, in the Navajo terminology, but the contemporary Pueblans don't like that name. They prefer ancestral Pueblans. And they preceded the Navajo by thousands of years. Uh, they think that they emerged about 12th century BC, whereas the Navajo are, are quite recent settlers in that area. There's some more Anasazi ruins, but with petrographs in the background. And we saw, or shown, we're shown a lot of petrographs. Um, what they symbolize is, is not really well known. These look like uh, hand prints, but what these mean is still unknown. But as well as petrographs, which is a, a painting on rock, there were petroglyphs, which is um, carving on a rock. These ones were obviously longhorn sheep, which can uh, be seen in the area. Not sure what that is. This is a, a well developed longhorn sheep with wheels, or probably not. We also took the opportunity to pop up to Forrest Gump Point. This is, uh, if you've ever seen the film Forrest Gump, it spends part of it running back and forwards across the USA and uh, suddenly decides at some point that he's had enough of that and goes home. But this is where he actually stopped his run. With these views of the Mises in the back. So having uh, seen Monument Valley, we then moved drove on from Kayenta up to uh, the town Moab and onto Arches National Park. Now there they, they've got a, a system where you have to book online for a timed entrance. And this was to um, control access so that the place didn't get too crowded uh, was, was the reason given for this. So we were a little concerned about how crowded it might actually be and Although we tried to arrive at, uh, at the right window for our ticket, we got there about 30 minutes early and the, the ranger just let us straight in. So it obviously wasn't as important as it laid out on the website. But it was still quite a crowded um, park, that's for sure, but not too bad, all, all things considered. And uh, we then, after seeing the Arches Park, stayed in Moab for the night and then so I went to visit Cameron's. So in Arches Park, there are all sorts of rock formations and obviously that. Uh, this, this rock formation is called the Courthouse Towers. Not sure why, but there we go. And here, a uh, couple of formations, one called the Three Gossips, and another you might be able to see it, the Sheep Rock. You can see this. Looks a bit like a merino sheep. But strangely, as you drive on, uh, the three gossips turns into four gossips. So uh, not quite sure about that. Another feature there is the balanced rock. And this is um, two different types of sandstone. This one's a bit harder. This, this is softer and erodes more readily. And eventually this will erode away and the capstone will fall off. As has happened, there used to be a smaller version of this nearby and in the 70s it collapsed during one winter. Because of course the water that gets into all these cracks freezes and thaws and causes damage to the rock. So this won't last 
more than a couple of hundred years probably. Uh, the Arches National Park is um, surrounded by mountains and one of the ranges is the LaSalle Mountains. That's a quite a good backdrop for this turret arch. Interestingly, when you get to the other side of turret arch, it changes colour completely. All depends on which way the sun is shining at the time. So you can see this is quite a significant arch and it's got a, another pothole here. And if you get the sun behind here, quite a good effect. Nearby, we saw some uh, some young guys rock climbing. I was quite surprised in the National Park. But they climbed up this pillar and then abseiled down. Uh, this guy didn't even bother with his climbing boots. And when they got to the bottom, we were having a chat with them. And they said it, it's absolutely easy to, to go climbing in the park. You, you don't, you know, you should, you should get your permission as you enter. But, um, and you, certain areas you can and certain areas you can't. But said it's quite a, a popular climbing area. That was a bit of entertainment for half an hour. Uh, also across the way from the uh, turret arch is this thing called the Parade of Elephants. You might be able to certainly see the lead elephant here. It's quite obvious. Here's its trunk, and head, four legs, hind legs, body. And then further on is the north window and south window, sometimes called the spectacles. The north window here, again, you see the scale of things because of these uh, people here, quite huge. Another view of the north window, but looking through turret arch. Here's one of the most famous arches there, the delicate arch. We didn't have time to, to do the two hour height to get to this side of it and get all the, uh, the views that most people of a delicate art, but there was a shorter walk to look at it from the other side and things I've got a, a good zoom lens, I could get a recent photograph of it. That's the, the sort of iconic arch for the, the park. Here's another one called Landscape Arch, which you can see is very thin and uh, apparently uh, uh, I think it was in the 90s, I'm not sure about that. But uh, a 60-foot slab had fallen off from here. So this arch is probably not long for uh, its existence. And they'd fenced it off so you, you, you couldn't get the, the shot that I wanted because uh, obviously it was considered a bit too dangerous to get near the arch, especially not underneath it. But anyway, quite, quite a spectacular arch. Here's an area they called the Fiery Furnace. Um, we weren't there at the best time of day. You want to be late afternoon. Apparently this turns fiery orange red um, because it's got a, a white sandstone on the top. It makes for quite a... Some of the wildlife we saw were the black-throated sparrow. That's another bird we don't get up here, but it's very common down there. A little critter called a wild tailed and white tailed antelope squirrel. And some new plants that we haven't seen before it was the fendless spring parsley and uh, black brush and Utah service berry. Right, a, a sizable bush with really white flowers. We then went on to the canyon lands the next day. And must say, weren't that impressed with them, uh, apart from these viewpoints. But that would probably be because the Canyon Rams area is mainly for hiking and uh, uh, four wheel drive treks. Uh, but nevertheless, the half day we had there, we, we could see some of these lovely overlooks from uh, you're on top of one of the mesas and looking down into the uh, in this case at Dead Horse Point, you're looking at the Colorado River. 
and you've got this lovely panoramic view here. And nearby was a what's well, called a Uinta chipmunk, pretty much like the yellow pine chipmunks you get up here. Also, there you could see these solar evaporation ponds that were quite interesting. There were these bright blue ponds in this sort of rust brown deserty surrounds. And the explanation for them is that they were uh, a, a means to extract potash, potassium chloride. And apparently, uh, large deposits of potassium chloride were formed um, millions of years ago. And they're accessed by drilling down and pumping water into the salt deposit, which liquefies it. Uh, obviously, it's soluble. And then it, that, that solution is pumped up and put into these uh, uh, vinyl lined ponds. Uh, they add a, a blue dye to make them darker so that they will um, heat up more readily. And that leads to evaporation, drying out, and then the potassium chloride is, is collected. But they were quite weird looking, all these shades of blue, depending on how much evaporation had taken place in each of these collecting ponds. We then went on from Dead Horse Canyon to the Canyonlands Island in the Sky. And there were three parts to Canyonlands Island in the Sky, the maze and the needles. Maze and needles are mainly used by hikers and uh, four-wheel drive trekkers. But yeah, this is Buck Canyon. This is the Buck Canyon, and here's the overlook. Again, quite a spectacular panorama. Further on, there's another place called the Grand Viewpoint Overlook, where you've got some white rim sandstone and this area called Monument Basin with all these pillars, i.e. the monuments. And then there's the Green River Outlook, which uh, lets you see Eka Butte, another butte, Turk's Head. And then it, this, this valley is the Green River Valley. And again, we see some of this white rim sandstone. So that is the end. Thank you very much, uh, Richard. If you will stop the screen sharing. Yep, just that. Put the uh, gallery on. So th again, thank for a fantastic uh, presentation with beautiful, beautiful photographs of thank you. Uh, the topography, but also all the birds and plant life that you saw. So. Uh, any questions or comments? I see Beverly, you have your hand up. You have to unmute yourself, Beverly. Good. I, I was at, I was looking for a clapping sound, actually. Okay. I wasn't. I, I loved. I lo I loved the bird pictures. They were super. Oh, good. Good. Any other questions, comments? Linda. I have a question. Hi, yeah. thank you. I'm sorry I missed the first part because uh, I lost track of time, but it was fascinating. I was just wondering, what is the sound like when you are in those very narrow um, canyons? Does it echo or is it quiet or do you hear insects? I just uh, wonder what it is like sonically, like on these all these landscapes you're in. That's sure. So no, there wasn't really uh, echoing in the slot canyons. I would say that it, it kind of deadens the sound. The the floors are sand, maybe that is part of it, but no no echoes. Um, what insects? Well, I can't remember seeing an insect, but we did see a spider, uh, <laughs> and it was a black widow. So uh, quite a poisonous spider. Do you see any? Birds soaring overhead, like any eagles, vultures, no, hawks, or anything? No, not whilst you're in the canyons. You, they they are so narrow that you. Uh, I, I did show one or two shots where you could see the sky, but it it generally you're only seeing this little patch of sky. 
So no, when we got out of the canyon, uh, no, we didn't. The only birds I saw soaring were turkey vultures. Okay. I didn't see any hawks. Okay, thank you. And yeah. It was beautiful, absolutely stunning. Thank you. Yeah, I, I can't see everyone on my screen, so you can just keep in and talk if you wish to. Go ahead. Uh, hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can yes. hear you. Yes, thank you, Richard. That was wonderful. I grew up uh, near some of those things, but you oh, yeah. saw much more than I did. The uh, what you call the well-groomed palms. Well, I'm in the uh, radical sect that does not like to see them groomed at all. Oh, yeah. uh, it's it's really a big racket uh, all over that area to have them uh, trimmed very often. It's totally unnecessary. Uh, <laughs> The uh, the plant uh, spelled C H O L L A is a Spanish word and it's pronounced choya. There we go. My pronunciation. Oh, I'm the, sure I got all the Navajo words wrong as well. <laughs> uh, you said that those uh, uh, deep uh, canyons were carved by water and flooding. Mm -hmm. I believe that I've heard that it's also the wind. Oh yeah, yeah. The wind certainly plays a a major role. Yeah. The uh, black and white uh, picture uh, had a really nice blue sky in there, so I don't know how you managed that. Oh, that's a cheat. Um, so <laughs> the, the program I used, uh, Luminar Neo. When you turn a, a photograph uh, from color to black and white, of course the original is still really color. So you can change the saturation on different colors. So if you oh. put the saturation on blue, on the black and white conversion, the sky becomes blue. Interesting, interesting. And and uh, I, this next thing, I think you probably were joking when you said that the log was keeping the two sides it's apart. Yeah, so good, good. You were joking. Now, yeah. when, we were, when we were kids growing up in Southern California, they would... Uh, the adults would warn us about the flash floods. This is a, I never saw one, but we were always warned, oh, no, over here you have to worry about the flash floods. So we were always looking around and listening for any flash floods, but we never saw or heard one. Well, I don't, it'd be interesting. I don't, I don't know what happened, but it was only a few months later, or a couple of months later, they had major floods, didn't they, uh, last year in mm -hmm. Southern mm -hmm. California? Yeah. But... Yeah. Whether they had a flash flood that went through the slot canyons, I, d I don't know. I didn't see anything about that. Just how things like, well, that, uh, what's it called? Burning Man Festival got absolutely ruined by mud, didn't it? Yeah, yeah. That was northern Nevada, northwest. Yeah. yeah. Where so I, lived. I wonder if the same uh, rainstorms had caused a, a flash flood through the canyons. Awesome. And lastly, if I were going there, I would stop in and see Slab City. Oh, yes. Yeah. Have you heard of Slab City? Uh, that was mentioned is um, they've got these painted rocks, right? No. So that was Slab City. Where the... Oh, the slabs uh, are uh, slabs of concrete from an old uh, military oh, okay. installation where people go there and squat and live there. All right. Oh, is that where all the old car wrecks is? I don't, I've seen pictures, but I don't remember seeing that. But anyway, no, we didn't, we didn't. a lot of, I'd go there for, to, to meet the strange characters. because Yeah, that sounds reasonable. Yeah. But there, yeah, there was lots of things. I'd love to go back to Utah or Arizona again. And I mean, we didn't get to Zion. But yeah. There's yeah. all sorts of things we missed out on. So. so if anybody wants Slab City, it's near the Sunny Bono uh marker you had on the map oh yeah yeah okay yeah it was i was surprised to see his name down there but uh found out why <laughs> that he he was uh mayor of palm springs for quite some time any other questions or comments uh yes uh richard i enjoyed your presentation Every single time. Um, about the Antelope uh, Canyon, 
Mm-hmm. Uh, it's so, so, so <laughs> incredibly beautiful. Um, but they were caught, I mean, the forms were caused by waves, by by water, by wind. Uh, so it's, by, it, it is basically the sandstone. Uh, so do, is there any need to protect it? Because sandstone, I don't know, it's not the hardest kind of stone. Uh, but uh, that's why it can be carved, of course. Right. But um, is there any need to protect it? And uh, secondly, the shapes, do they change uh, every, I guess, thousands of years, I guess, right? Uh, well, I don't I don't really know the answer. I certainly don't know whether they have any protection. Certainly the, the Navajo families, each canyon is uh, under the control of a separate uh, Navajo family. Uh, it's a major source of income for them, so I'm sure they have uh, an interest in that. But because it takes such a long time to change them, I wouldn't think that there would be any need for protection and such. And yes, I mean, they do change, obviously, but it, it's over a time period that, that isn't noticeable by the human eye, really. But in a few thousand years, they will be very different looking, I'm sure. <laughs> Same as in Monument Valley. I mean, the, the uh, and the arches, the, some of these um, features will erode and collapse, but not in our lifetime. Helen. Thank you very much, Richard. That was wonderful. Brought back great memories for me. But I wondered how hot it was when you were there, because we found it, it was very hot for us. It it was hot. I, uh, I'm, not, I'm not a person who likes the heat too much, but we found uh, like playing golf, was, it was very hot down in Palm Desert. And uh, there, there'd be no way you could have walked the golf courses. I thought some people would manage it, but... I wouldn't have been at all comfortable. Um, the slot canyons, they're so shaded, it, that wasn't too hot. But Monument Valley was, again, very hot. So it was, um, I think we got into the 30s. Yeah, but not. we didn't hit the 40s at all. It was, um, I think, uh, early enough in the year for it to be hot by our standards, but not by the locals. I didn't think it was hot. Yeah. Well, again, Richard, thanks for a wonderful presentation. Before we quit today, just to uh, mention that our next talk in February will be on February the 15th. And Don and Lorna Blake are going to talk with a little bit of input from me on a recent cruise down the Rhone River. Uh, both of us did the same cruise in the opposite direction, two weeks apart. It just so happened we didn't communicate with each other before, but we did. So we've decided to merge a little bit of our photographs and talk about this together. But mainly uh, Don and Lorna will give the talk, and I'll just chip in a little. And the last thing I want to mention is that we uh, started a new initiative uh, just before the holidays to try and see if uh, there were people who wanted to get together with other people in our group uh, with the idea that maybe in the future they might be compatible and want to do a trip together uh, because some people had expressed an interest in doing that. We have uh, six people so far who have indicated that they would like to participate in that kind of activity. And uh, before we uh, make arrangements to get this small group together so they can communicate with each other and let you know that you have the opportunity if you're interested in something like that to contact Sarah who is always copied on the emails that I send out and I will send out an email after this which will have her name and email address on it. She's in the uh, office from the Emeritus College and once we have completed that I think uh, Sarah will try to organize something, some way of having this small group of people get together to chat with each other in person um, and not at a formal meeting of this group. So are there any other questions or comments before we close the meeting? 
Okay, well, thanks again, everyone. And uh, we look forward to seeing you again in uh, February. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.